what could cause a person to have low diastolic blood pressure? Medications are a big one. There are some medicines that are culprits for lowering your diastolic blood pressure more than your systolic, specifically, a class of medications called alpha blockers, or central acting antihypertensive agents. Another reason is age. As you get older, your vessels become a little more stiff, and that tends to raise your systolic pressure and lower your diastolic pressure. It's hard to reverse the aging process, but one potential therapy is to find ways to allow your vessels to retain their elasticity, or, if they've lost it, maybe ways to gain that back. The best current treatment is to lower dietary salt intake, which has been shown to be very closely linked with the elasticity of your vessels. The more salt you eat, the less elastic your vessels will be. Most people's salt intake is too high. Salt intake is a highly debated topic in medicine, but most believe that dietary salt intake of greater than 4 grams per day is too high, and less than 1.5 grams per day is too low. This depends on a person's age and underlying medical problems, but this range is a good rule of thumb. There is some data that the ideal salt intake for healthy people is around 3.6 grams per day, but again this is highly debated. UAB's Hypertension Group led by Dr. Suzanne O'Parrell and Dr. David Calhoun, has detailed much of the basic science showing the effect of salt at a molecular level in the blood vessels. On the inside, your blood vessels are lined with a thin monolayer of endothelial cells. In an experimental setting, adding salt to these cells causes changes almost immediately. They become less reactive, that means they stiffen up and lose their elasticity, which is what you actually see clinically. Additionally, the stiffening of the vessels happens very soon after you take on a salt load during eating, which is very interesting. Beyond changes in medications, what can people do to raise their diastolic pressure if it's too low? Lifestyle changes like diet and exercise can have immediate effects. Your inside changes much quicker than the mirror shows you. On the inside, you're getting much more healthy by eating better, getting exercise, controlling your weight and not smoking. Everyone thinks, I'm going to have to do this for six months or a year before I see any changes. That's not true. The body is very dynamic. Within a few weeks, you can see the benefits of lifestyle change. In fact, with dietary changes in salt intake, you can see a difference in a day or two. If someone does have low diastolic pressure, what should they, and their doctors, look for? If they aren't on medications that we could adjust, the important thing is close monitoring, maybe seeing a patient more frequently in clinic and monitoring them closely for cardiovascular disease or heart failure symptoms. Your original study in hypertension got a lot of attention. What are you working on now? We're finalizing some papers that address two big criticisms of that study. The first criticism was that we were looking strictly, as the name suggests, at isolated diastolic hypotension. We didn't really care at the time what the systolic pressure was doing, but a high systolic pressure is a risk for heart failure, among other things. When we looked at the patients in our study, their systolic blood pressures were all relatively normal, and we adjusted for patients with a history of hypertension. So we actually went back and redid the analysis, completely excluding people with hypertension. And the results still remain true. In fact, the association was even stronger. The other criticism involved something called pulse pressure. That's the difference between your systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And multiple studies have shown that a widened pulse pressure is also a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Some fellow researchers said, really, all you're looking at is just a wider pulse pressure. This isn't necessarily novel, that's been shown before. So we've actually looked at pulse pressure differences in all these patients and broken them down by differences in pulse pressure. And even when we adjusted for pulse pressure, the conclusion about the low diastolic pressure still rang true. We actually looked at three different groups of pulse pressure, normal, wide and really wide. And it was true throughout. Low diastolic blood pressure increased one's risk for heart failure. You also have an interest in diastolic heart failure. What is that? <laughs>
There are two different types of heart failure, one where the pumping function of the heart is abnormal, that is known as systolic heart failure, and one where the relaxation function is abnormal, that is known as diastolic heart failure. We have lots of medicines for, and experience treating, systolic heart failure, which is also called heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, everything from beta blockers, ACE inhibitors and ARBs to mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists and statins. Diastolic heart failure, or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, has no approved pharmacologic therapies to date. It was widely overlooked, to be honest, until about 10 to 15 years ago, when physicians realized that these poor patients were having terrible heart failure symptoms but none of the classic objective measures of heart failure. In most cases, you can't even tell the difference between a person with systolic and diastolic heart failure based on their symptoms. On the inside, however, their heart is pumping just fine, the problem is their heart is stiff, it doesn't relax as well as it should. That stiffness leads fluid to back up into the lungs and extremities and causes a lot of the symptoms that you have with systolic heart failure, but the pumping function of the heart is normal. Now that there is an awareness of diastolic heart failure, we're realizing that it is a very common problem. It looks like there are as many people with diastolic heart failure as with systolic heart failure. As a matter of fact, there may even be more people with diastolic heart failure. It has become a heavily studied form of heart failure right now. Everyone is clamoring to get a medicine to help these patients, because it turns out to be very prevalent, and a lot of times they have the same morbidity and mortality as people with systolic heart failure. Let me know what do you think. Looking forward to your comments.